Hi, my name is Manish Gupta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about stable diffusion, high resolution image synthesis with latent diffusion models. So we'll talk about what are the latent diffusion models and uh, what is the broad architecture of stable diffusion? What, what do its results look like? What are the different applications for stable diffusion model? Okay. So let's start with what is stable diffusion? Uh, it's a model for synthetic image generation, uh, like other models, ImageN, DALI2, and so on. It leverages diffusion models with classifier free guidance. Again, if you want to know more details about how do diffusion models work, please see one of those videos that I've recorded earlier talking about various mathematical underpinnings of the diffusion models. Um, stable diffusion decomposes the image formation process into a sequential application of denoising autoencoders and diffusion models. So unlike uh, previous models, which were uh, completely diffusion models and they operated in the image pixel space, stable diffusion sort of decomposed this process into two parts, one denoising autoencoders and the second diffusion models. Okay. Um, so um, the problem with diffusion models uh, or, or models based on diffusion model training uh, like ImageN and DALI2 is that uh, they, are, they are very inefficient in some ways because they operate in pixel space. So training wise, they take hundreds of GPU days. Inference wise, it takes about five days on uh, a hundred uh, GPU for 50K samples to be generated, right? So uh, they actually take, they're pretty inefficient in that sense. So how does stable diffusion solve this problem? Well, it applies diffusion models in the latent space of powerful pre-trained autoencoders, and it does not do diffusion models in the pixel space. And that is why it is pretty efficient in that sense. Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, because it uses pre-trained autoencoders so as to first uh, uh, reduce the overall resolution of the image, it provides a very good trade-off between complexity reduction and detail preservation. Right? So it reduces the complexity by first reducing uh, the large uh, or high resolution uh, images to low resolution images using pre-trained autoencoders. And then, uh, uh, but, but while doing so, it also preserves the uh, you know, details by actually uh, also upsampling it later when diffusion models have worked worked upon. Um, so, so thus it also, in fact, boosts visual fidelity as we'll see in the results at the end. It is useful for a variety of applications. A, several, a large number of applications have been pumped using diffusion models, unconditional image generation, class conditional image generation, text conditional image generation, layout or bound, bounded box conditional image generation, super resolution, image in painting, semantic synthesis using segmentation masks. Uh, in fact, super resolution, yes, it can actually uh, create images uh, up to megapixel uh, in, in size, right? Uh, so, so uh, you know, 1000 cross 1000 pixels and so on. So that's that. Now, so uh, the basic uh, architecture behind stable diffusion is the latent diffusion model. Okay. So what is latent about latent diffusion model is what we want to understand in this slide. Okay. Uh, so here is a plot and what does this plot do? Well, uh, on the X axis you see bits per dimension and on the Y axis you see distortion. So or RMSC, right? So it's more like an error, right? So what does this indicate? This indicates that a whole, uh, you know, when you are when you are doing these diffusion, a whole bunch of bits are actually uh, involved. So most bits of a digital image correspond to imperceptible details. They are actually working on details, and most of the bits are capturing information about uh, deep details, right? Which does not lead to any perceptible difference in the images, right? You see, uh, these images look more or less the same. Of course, they are different because there is information and there is minor differences, but perceptual compression, if you think about perceptual differences, they don't exist much. And most of the bits really take care of these minute details which don't matter too much for perception. And therefore, latent diffusion models essentially handle, uh, or rather, the, uh, the stable diffusion model handles this perceptual compression using autoencoders. Okay. Uh, in fact, this is the uh, biggest difference between uh, stable diffusion and other models that uh, stable diffusion does not work in pixel space. In fact, it uh, uh, does not use uh, therefore diffusion models in pixel space, but but actually, uh, uh, and and therefore avoids the pixel level superfluous computations. An unnecessary expensive optimization and inference, right? So it actually uses autoencoders so as to compress the pixel space to much smaller latent space. Um, a very few bits are actually involved in doing semantic compression. Semantic compression basically means uh, some, something that captures the semantics in the image, right? Uh, very important uh, aspects of the image. Uh, and uh, this is where diffusion models uh, or stable diffusion actually uses latent diffusion models. 
Thus, the training actually contains two parts. One is about perceptual compression stage and the other is about semantic compression, right? So perceptual compression stage, as we talked, uses autoencoder. It removes high frequency details, but still learns little semantic variation. And not too much of semantic variation, but little semantic variation. Semantic compression actually uh, generate uh, it's, it's the actual generative model and it learns the semantic and conceptual composition of the data. Okay. So in general, uh, the way uh, the training happens is that uh, you uh, so so the uh, the stable diffusion model of course contains uh, three main parts. One is perceptual compression, right? Uh, which is basically done using autoencoder. This is an autoencoder as you see here. The second part is the latent diffusion model, which is for semantic compression. And the third part is about conditioning. So what all kinds of conditioning information can you pass uh, in these diffusion model uh, in the diffusion process? OK, so as you see, uh, given a training image, you would first do an encoding so as to get uh, uh, a reduced dimensionality uh, you know, image. Uh, although this looks like a Z, a vector, but it is practically more of an image. So you actually do get 2D image here, right? And you pass it through the diffusion process, right? You get uh, ZT. Uh, you know, which is basically more or less noise right at the end. And uh, then, of course, you can actually uh, take that noise uh, or other, uh, even at the sampling time, right? You can take that noise and then you can add conditioning information at different steps of this unit. So you see this is the, uh, this box is a unit model. So you can add that noise, uh, you know, at, in different attention layers of the unit. Uh, this is transformer attention layers, as you see, right? And uh, thereby come up with uh, a nice uh, low resolution uh, generated image. Now this low resolution image is basically upsampled using the uh, autoencoder uh, decoder so as to get uh, so as to get the image in the pixel space okay so you see the denoising step uh, which is basically about uh, uh, about uh, you know uh, denoising uh, you know the denoising step which is basically about the diffusion model essentially happens in the latent space and not in the pixel space okay um, you also see this this one uh, the autoencoder essentially takes the pixel space image and converts it to latent space or the decoder of the autoencoder takes the image generated in the latent space and brings it back to the pixel space okay so that's that um so let's look at into details here yeah, of course it's the same image and we are talking about the details of uh, the latent diffusion models as i mentioned there are three parts perceptual image compression using autoencoders latent diffusion models and conditional mechanisms conditioning mechanisms right so the perceptual image compression actually uses autoencoders uh, and uh, it uh, uh, downsamples downsamples an image by a factor of f which basically means it reduces uh, height by f and width by f right now f can be considered as 2 raised to m so this is the factors that they use you know downsample 2x 5 4x and 8x and 16x and so on okay um, pixel level, uh, pixel space perceptual. So, so basically, this autoencoder, of course, is trained on typical loss functions uh, like uh, pixel space perceptual loss, so L1, L2 kind of loss at pixel level, and also patch based adversarial uh, objective. So, this local uh, region objective is also super important so as to have local realism in the image, besides just learning from L1, L2 losses. Okay. Uh, while doing so, in fact, they also use two different kinds of other experiment with two different kinds of regularizers. One is the KL divergence regularizer, which imposes a slight uh, uh, KL penalty towards a standard normal on the learned latent. So these latents should basically follow uh, the ideas to make them follow normal distribution. Okay. Uh, and then there is the, another uh, um, regularizer that they experiment with, VQ regularization, which uses a vector quantization layer in the decoder. Now that's about the autoencoder. Uh, this is the autoencoder part. Uh, the second part is, of course, latent diffusion model. And uh, the latent diffusion model, if you think of it, it's nothing new. Uh, I mean, in some ways, uh, uh, even image and, and other such models also use similar kind of latent diffusion model. So they use with classifier free guidance and they use unit. Uh, the interesting part is they use only 2D convolutions in the unit. So that's something interesting. Yeah. Otherwise, it is more or less standard. Um, the goal of the latent diffusion model is to basically learn a theta, learn the parameters of this uh, unit such that it can nicely predict the amount of noise uh, to be subtracted from uh, from a white noise uh, input. You know, uh, step by step, how much noise should you subtract over 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 diffusion steps so as to finally get an image which uh, looks looks very nice, very real. Okay. While doing so, in fact. Uh, um, uh, the, the unit model actually has uh, attentional layers, right? And uh, essentially, uh, that is where the conditioning input can be passed in. Of course, of course, the conditioning input uh, must be passed through some encoder, some some sort of uh, domain-specific encoder. So, for example, if you're conditioning on text, then you may use some transform model conditioning on images. Maybe you can use clip encoder. Um, you know, uh, semantic maps again, segmentation maps. You can use clip encoder and so on, right? 
So uh, uh, the conditioning mechanisms, of course, control the synthesis process, the image generation process through inputs Y. So you can call these inputs as Y, such as text semantic maps or other image to image translation tasks. Uh, the domain specific encoder. So there's this domain specific encoder which projects Y onto uh, an intermediate representation, which is then fed uh, to the unit model um, in a, you know, via cross attention layers, cross attention layers, right? So now, of course, there are two parameters to be trained. One is, or rather, two models to be trained. One is this epsilon theta, and the other is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, tau theta. Uh, and both of them are trained jointly uh, using this kind of a loss function. So since it's conditioned, therefore, your loss function basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is still trying to estimate the same uh, noise to be subtracted. But then uh, the estimate really depends not just on z and t, but also depends on the conditioning information hmm? tau, tau theta of y. Okay. Here are some examples of uh, um, uh, class conditional synthesis and uh, text to image synthesis. So class conditional basically means there's no text, but only class which is supplied. So basically just tell it, hey, generate images uh, which look like celebrities or generate images that look like churches or beds and so on. Okay. So you see these images look pretty cute. I mean, pretty realistic in that sense is they are all generated and you know, these people don't exist in reality. Okay. Uh, text to image generation. So here you condition on text. So basically you tell that, hey, please give me a street sign that reads latent diffusion. Uh, yeah, it does make spelling mistakes, uh, uh, you know, in in some some ways, right? Uh, but uh, you can also give interesting things like a painting of a squirrel eating a burger and so on. Okay. So those are some examples. Um, and uh, in their case, they basically trained this text to image uh, synthesis model on Lyon dataset. Um, but the idea is that yes, the model can actually condition on various kinds of information like class label or text uh, or, or text captions, right? And we'll see later, you know, you can condition it on more things and therefore come up with more interesting applications. But uh, a quick look on uh, uh, how does this perceptual compression lead to trade off with respect to quality? Hmm? One may think that uh, if you are doing diffusion in the original pixel space, you should get better quality since you are doing latent diffusion model. You're sort of doing diffusion in a smaller space. So maybe you lose on quality, but that's not true. Remember, that is why, in fact, I motivated in the beginning that uh, um, uh, to images, there are two parts, right? One which carries semantics, the other detailed part which, which does not care about perception, right? So, uh, so you know, these diagrams show something very interesting. So let's consider these latent diffusion models such that you have different levels of uh, compression, uh, perceptual compression. That is, you used autoencoders so as to reduce them by different factors. Uh, so downsampling factors could be 1 to 32, which basically means you reduce the size of the image uh, by, uh, you know, uh, by, by, by like, you know, uh, so, so LDM1 factor 1 basically means you didn't really reduce the size of the image. But factor two basically means you reduce the size of the image by two uh, or four or eight or 16 or 32, right? So what do you observe from this chart? So you see FID, FID is a distance measure, so lower the better. And what do you see at the uh, x-axis is train step. So if you basically have two million iterations, these are actually done for two million iterations, and this is for class conditional models on ImageNet, okay? So what do you observe? Uh, you observe again that if you have very small factors like LDM one or two, you know, blue and the and the orange curve. You basically observe that their FID score saturates, but then also saturates at at a uh, at a much much higher uh, FID score, right? And they are slow in training. In fact, saturate slowly. Okay. Uh, if you look at large F, so large factor like LDM 32, so it's like 32x reduction, right? In that sense, in the height and width both of the image, right? So which basically means the lot of reduction in the size. And what you observe is that uh, you see stagnating fidelity. It basically uh, stagnates, you know, it reaches a reasonable level of uh, fidelity, uh, but you know, uh, it has very poor FID score. Uh, of course, high scores, which basically means it's a it's a bad quality image. Okay. But then there is this nice sweet spot of factors four to sixteen. If you basically use those factors of compression using the autoencoder in the perceptual compression stage, you essentially get uh, high quality with less training time compared to LDM one. LDM one is of course a diffusion model without any latent part to it, right? It's called LDM, but it's LDM one means no no latent uh, reduction size reduction. Okay. Now uh, let's look at the right side plots. So you see uh, this FID versus sample throughout uh, throughput. So this is for generation time. So essentially, um, I mean, the left side clearly says that uh, using uh, latent diffusion models, you can actually generate better quality images in lesser amount of training time. 
Okay, in train a model in less amount of train time. By the way, I didn't talk about inception score, but the trains trends hold the same. So if you look at uh, these three curves, which are LDM 4, 8 and 16, you basically get much better inception score uh, way early, uh, way early, right? Way early compared to the best, you know, compared to the best that you can get if you uh, used, uh, uh, let's say, LDM 2 or uh, LDM 1. Well, LDM 1 is blue, so you know, way early. Uh, so essentially, uh, if LDM 1 took like 2 million steps to reach there, LDM uh, uh, four or five basically just uh, uh, took like 0.1 million steps to reach there. So it's it's way faster, right? At train time. Sampling speed. So uh, if you look at the left part, you know, you have throughput samples per second. So how many samples can you extract per second? And uh, the way you basically make it faster at sampling time is to reduce the number of denoising steps, right? So diffusion process has several denoising steps and you basically reduce those steps and you get samples faster, okay? So uh, and the you know the denying steps are varied from 10 to 10, 50, 10 20 50 100 and 200 uh, of course the higher number of denying steps basically means less less uh, less throughput less samples per second okay so what you observe is that and, and on the left side you basically uh, uh, see uh, uh, you know, uh, you basically uh, these are for two different data sets. So essentially, um, uh, this is for uh, uh, celeb QA data set. Sorry, so this is a, another data set. So it is celeb uh, celeb data set, celebrities data set. On the right side, you see the plot for the ImageNet data set, right? And what you observe is that LDM four to eight, right? The four and eight. So basically, the, the these two essentially have lower FID and higher throughput compared to LDM one, right? So if you look at LDM one. You have lower FID and higher throughput. Now, what else do you want? Right. So that's basically, uh, and and whether you compare on, uh, you know, uh, celeb data set or on the ImageNet data set, you see the same trend holding. Okay. So that's good. So basically, compared to the diffusion models, latent diffusion models have a very awesome promise. You know, training is faster, uh, inference is faster, quality of the images generated is awesome, is better. Okay. Uh, well, here are some more examples. So if you can do conditioning on class label or essentially on the text, you can actually also do conditioning on the layout. So essentially you can um, feed in these uh, layouts, so the bounding boxes, and then ask it to generate images which conform to those layouts. Or you could feed in the segment segmentation maps uh, and you could ask the model uh, to generate very high quality images, you know, super high quality images uh, which conform to these segmentation masks. You could also use these kinds of models to do super resolution. So now, of course, as you see, SR3 is a really awesome other uh, super resolution model. So if, if you compare LDM SR with SR3, well, it is comparable. It outperforms SR3 in terms of the FID score, but uh, SR3 actually has a better uh, a better inception score. So yeah, I mean, you know, so more or less it's sort of comparable in terms of quality. Okay. Um, clearly, these models can also be used for in-painting uh, because it can take in-painting masks also as conditional input. So uh, what is in-painting for beginners? Basically, of course, in-painting is filling uh, mask regions of an image uh, with the new content, either because parts of the image are corrupted or sort of you want to replace some undesirable content in the image. Uh, you know, uh, with with you, with the with the with the content that gels well with the remaining part of the image, right? So that is another application where where a stable diffusion model can be used. So this is all about stable diffusion that I had. Uh, you know, just quickly summarizing the video. Stable diffusion essentially uh, it consists of two main parts: auto encoders and latent diffusion models. Of course, they also have conditioning information as an important part. It leads to better quality image generation with low training and inference timings. Um, it uh, you know the latent diffusion models involve cross attention based unit where uh, uh, such that it can actually consume the conditioning information and uh, that conditioning information leads to several applications that have been shown uh, to work awesomely well with stable diffusion model unconditioned image generation class conditional image generation text conditional image generation layout or bounding box conditional image generation super resolution in painting semantic synthesis and so on if you want to you know look at the code or play around more with stable diffusion that's the link and thank you for watching. Connect with me on my LinkedIn or look at my research on my homepage. Thank you.